It is the most important right that Americans have. It's not a coincidence or an accident that it's named in the First Amendment to the Constitution. Without it, no democratic society can be democratic for long. And I'm an absolutist. That is, um, I believe that, for example, people say to me, but what about hate speech? Well, hate speech is much more important than love speech. And the reason is, I'm much more interested in knowing whom I should not turn my back on than I am interested in figuring out who loves me. The following is a conversation with Harvey Silverglade, a legendary free speech advocate, co-founder of FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, and the author of several books on the freedom of speech and criminal justice, including The Shadow University, The Betrayal of Liberty on America's Campuses. Harvey is running to be on the Harvard Board of Overseers this year with a write-in campaign, so you have to spell his name correctly, Silverglade promising to advocate for free speech and to push for reducing the size of Harvard's administration bureaucracy. Election is over this Tuesday, May 16th at 5 p.m. Eastern. To vote, you have to be Harvard alumni. So if you happen to be one, please vote online. It's a good way to support freedom of speech on Harvard campus. Instructions how to do so are in the description. As a side note, please allow me to say that since there are several Controversial conversations coming up. I tried to make sure that this podcast is a platform for free discourse where ideas are not censored, but explored, and if necessary, challenged in a thoughtful and pathetic way. It's by having such difficult conversations, not by avoiding them, that we can begin to heal divides and to shed light on the dark parts of human history and human nature. This is the Lex Friedman Podcast. To support it, please check out our sponsors in the description. And now, dear friends, here's Harvey Silverglade. You co-founded the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, also known as FIRE, a legendary organization that fights for the freedom of speech for all Americans in our courtrooms, on our campuses, and in our culture. So let's start with a big question. What is freedom of speech? First of all, the organization, when I co-founded it in 1999, was called the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. It focused on free speech issues on college campuses in academia. And only earlier this year did we decide to expand our reach beyond the campuses, which is why the name, although the acronym FIRE remains, it's now the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression. The E used to be education. The E used to be education, it's now expression. And we basically do a lot of the cases the ACLU used to do. The ACLU now more is as the, the, a progressive organization rather than a civil liberties organization. And, um, and we've taken the, um, the, the role of dealing with free speech in, in the society generally. In, and now this is a particularly, um, uh, an era prone to censorship. Um, everybody thinks they're right and that and people who disagree with them should not be able to voice their views. It's a very difficult period right now, both on campus and off campus. Um, it's about as, as intolerant an era as I can remember. In, I'm, I'm gonna be 81 May 10th. I was born on Mother's Day, 1942. And uh, I can't remember it being this bad. I was born during the McCarthy era um, so that says a lot. And um, it sort of reminds me of that. Well, let's start with that, almost a philosophical question, a legal question, a human question. What is this freedom that you care so much about, that you fought for so much, freedom of speech? It is the most important right that Americans have. It's not a coincidence or an accident that it's named in the First Amendment to the Constitution. Without it, no democratic society can be democratic for long. And I'm an absolutist. That is, um, I believe that, for example, people say to me, but what about hate speech? Well, hate speech is much more important than love speech. And the reason is, I'm much more interested in knowing whom I should not turn my back on 
that I am interested in figuring out who loves me or who likes me. So uh, hate speech is the most important in my view, and yet it's uh, it's banned in, for example, schools. It's unbelievable. Um, kids are uh, not schooled into uh, understanding the glory of the First Amendment when when schools uh, say to them they shouldn't say things that are going to make somebody feel bad. Um, I mean, the purpose of speech is to express honest views that people have. And um, so I believe hate speech is as important as love speech, and f my view is more important. So it should be brought to the surface rather than operate in the shadows. Absolutely, absolutely. What is the connection between freedom of speech and freedom of thought? Well, in a free society, th thoughts start in the brain and then they come out the mouth. So they're different ends of the same spectrum. So to you, the censorship of speech eventually leads to a censorship of thought. Of course, censorship of the mode by which other people know what you're thinking. So there's some aspect of our society that is, uh, the thinking is done collectively and without being able to speak to each other, we cannot do this kind of collective Correct. thinking. And out of speech, the theory is that ultimately out of speech comes truth. That isn't necessarily so, but I do think that when there's free speech, better decisions are made because people put their views on the table in a frank, accurate way. And then those views mix together and clash and out of that, usually, uh, comes the better the better uh, decision. Um, not always, but usually, or more more often than not. But if somebody is not allowed to be a, you know uh, uh, sit at the table of decision making, then the decision making process is poorer, um, less robust, less diverse, and ultimately less successful. So can you uh, elaborate on the idea of free speech absolutism? So hate speech can be quite painful to quite a large number of people. Does well, this worry you? Yep. Yeah. Uh, living in a free society requires that you expose yourself to some discomfort, you call it pain. It's maybe emotional pain, it's not physical pain, um, but it's, uh, it's the price we pay for living in a free society. Every so often we're insulted, we're uh, emotionally hurt. Think of the alternative. All the alternatives are worse. Nobody ever promised us a rose garden. We're lucky to be in a country that has the First Amendment. It's also the, only, it's the most diverse country in the world because of immigration. I mean, my, my grandparents, uh, my father's side came over from Russia. Uh, my mother's side came over from Poland. I'm very happy that my grandparents came in from Russia. Uh, I would not want to be in Russia today. I'd probably be sharing a cell with a Wall Street Journal reporter. Um, so um, I'm, I'm thankful that they came in. And um, this is a great country. It's got troubles right now, but our country doesn't. And we've had... After we had a civil war, we had segregation, uh, we had the uh, decimation of the Indians, we're not perfect, but it's the best place in the world for somebody who values liberty. So you don't think that hate speech can empower large groups that uh, eventually lead to physical action, to physical harm to others? No, I don't. I think that, that um, we have developed a culture in which um, it's understood that if you don't like what you hear, you, you talk back. Mm -hmm. um, you, write, you write something. Um, um, we don't punch each other, we insult each other. Um, is insulting great? Well, I don't know, it's okay. I used to, as a kid in Brooklyn, where I was born, I was born and raised in Bensonhurst, we used to say, sticks and stones can break my bones, but names can never harm me. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely true. It was, what was true when I was five is true when I'm, I'm almost 81. So I've lived a long time. I've seen it all. And I'm talking from experience as well as theory. It's what happens when you reach your 80s. 
<laughs> I read that you had this line that you cannot be protected from being called an asshole. Correct. Okay. Especially if you're an asshole. <laughs> well, that's, uh, uh, but you don't have to be an asshole to be called an asshole. That's correct. And uh, I think the internet has taught me that. Well, the internet has posed a, a particular challenge to free speech absolutists because of some of the stuff that's on there is God awful. But I have no different rule for freedom of speech on the internet than I have uh, in newspapers or in lectures or in classrooms or or conversations among people. What do you think about uh, the tension between freedom of speech and freedom of reach, as is uh, kind of sometimes termed? So the internet really challenges that aspect. It allows well, speech yep. to become viral and spread uh, very quickly to a very large number of people. Yeah, well, you know, we've had We've had revolutions in um, in in uh, the modalities of communication. <clears throat> After all, newspapers were, were the first challenge. Um, radio and television posed a, a new challenge. Um, the FCC tried, but ultimately gave up the attempt to control um, obscenity, for example. Um, and the Supreme Court has been pretty close. The one thing that liberal and conservative Supreme Courts, right now we're in a conservative era due to Trump nom nom nominations. Um, during the, much, much of my life, we were the Warren Court. It was uh, William O. Douglas, so Brennan. It was a liberal court. Well, one thing they agree on is free speech. They don't agree on much else but they do agree on free speech. And I think the reason is that they recognize that, well, my group is in the ascendance today, but it may not be tomorrow. And I want to have objective, clear rules so that when I'm in the minority, I'm able to voice my opinion. And so uh, it's one of the few things that both sides of the political spectrum agree on. The only people who don't are the the people way over on the right that I call the fascists and the people way over on the left who are the communists. Um, but with respect to most people in this on the political spectrum, Republicans, Democrats, socialists, libertarians, um, uh, they agree on the primacy of free speech because it protects them when, when protection is needed. So to you, even on the internet, free speech absolutism should rule. Yes. Nobody's going to die. Remember, death threats are not law, are not protected. Um, nobody's going to die. So people are going to be a little bit insulted. That's the price you pay for living in a free society. And it's a small price, in my view. Um, people, Some people don't have as tough a hide as others. Well, then develop it. Um, I hope I don't want. I don't mean to sound uh, cruel, um, but you know, you're living in a free society. You develop a tough hide. So that's the cost uh, of living in a free society. Yep, there are. There's a cost. The thing is, it it can really hurt at scale to be cyberbullied, to be attacked for the ideas you express, or maybe ideas you didn't express, but that uh, somebody decided to lie about you, and uh, use that to to attack you. Well, first of all, there are there are some there are some exceptions to the First Amendment. Libel and slander is an exception. Um, direct threats are an exception. You know, if you if you say such and such, I will murder you. That is not lawful. If you say that somebody, um, if, if you say about somebody, oh, you know, um, you beat your wife. Um, that that is not lawful if, in fact, the person knows you don't beat your wife. There are some limits. Defamation is one. Direct threats are another. Um, so it's not absolute. This is not the First Amendment is not absolute, but it's is it's more absolute than it is in any other society, and it's pretty near absolute. Um, for, for example, fraud. If you uh, sell somebody a, a car. And you say, oh, this is in great running shape. And in fact, it's an old jalopy and it's not going to make it more than 10 miles. That's fraud. That's not free speech. 
Um, so free speech is not absolute. There are these limits, but they're very narrow, specific categories of limits. But uh, there's gray area here because while legally you're not allowed to defame a person, in the court of public opinion, especially with the aid of anonymity on the internet, rumors can spread at scale. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of people can make up things about you. You have to defend yourself. Uh, Using you know, more speech. We're, we're big, we're through freedom of speech, and we're big boys and girls. Um, you have to defend yourself. Um, you know, in, in, in some societies, if you say something, uh, uh, if you, right now, if you say something nasty about Putin, you'll end up in the gulag. Um, if you say something nasty about um, Biden, you end up in the New York Times. Where would you rather be? Well, let's talk about the thing you've done for over 20 years which is fight for the freedom of speech on college campuses. Uh, so why is freedom of speech important on college campuses? Well, it's important everywhere in the society, but it's most important on college campuses. Why? Because that's where we educate our young citizens. And if you are educated in, uh, under a notion that some dean can, uh, can call you on the carpet because you say something which is considered racist, or you can say something which is uh, considered uh, da you know, dangerous to uh, to social cohesion, um, then it's not a liberal arts college. No, um, the um, the theory that I used in in the Shadow University, a book you've written, the Shadow University, nineteen ninety eight, nineteen ninety eight. You were ahead of a lot of these things, I was, by the way. I'm afraid that as, as a pessimist, I always saw the bad side of things. Betrayal of Liberty on America's Campuses, The Shadow University, the, a book you co-authored with Alan Charles. Yes, cool. with, with one of my Princeton classmates, Alan Charles Coors, who's now an emeritus professor of uh, Enlightenment history at the University of Pennsylvania. I only taught for one semester, and I can go into that later, you know, the reason that I did not continue to teach in colleges. Um, it, it was Har Harvard Law School. I, I taught a course in the mid-1980s. Um, but in any event, um, the college campuses are one of the most important of all for, uh, for free speech because it's where people get education. And if you don't really get a good education, if certain points of view are not allowed to be expressed because education comes from the clash of ideas and you then have to decide. This is the this is how you become a thinking adult. Uh, you have to decide which ideas make more sense to you, which ones you're going to follow. Um, the college experience is transformative. And uh, if there is censorship on campuses, it's highly destructive of uh, the educational enterprise, and uh, ultimately to the entire society. You know, we have in the sciences. Um, we have um, a scientific method. Scientific method is you try experiments and you see which ones work and then you develop theories based upon the results of experiments. Well, this is not much different from every other aspect of life. You have to entertain different views on different subjects. You hear all the views and you make a decision as to which one's accurate and which one's not. So the scientific method I apply to, um, to non-science, to history, to journalism, um, to all of these things. So that scientific method includes ideas, hateful ideas also. Correct, if you don't allow hateful ideas. I mean, when, when scientists do experiments, nobody says to them, oh, you know, don't, don't do that experiment because it would be very bad if that turns out to be accurate, you know, that outcome. That's not the way it works. Um, every, every point of view is thrown into the marketplace, whether it's science or whether it's, uh, uh, you know, non-science. And that includes uh, the kind of ideas and the kind of discourse that might actually lead to an increase in hate on, yeah. ca on campuses? The, the, the First Amendment prohibits speech which is liable to produce imminent imminent violence yeah so for example um you know the um the exception is um yelling uh, falsely falsely yelling fire in a crowded movie theater 
a lot of people misstate it. They say, oh, um, the exception is yelling fire in a movie theater. Well, if there's really a fire, you're performing a real yes. important function they by yelling don't fire. That part. <laughs> but it's falsely yelling fire. Yeah. You would start a riot, people would be crushed, try to get out. So there are these, that, that's one of the exceptions of the First Amendment as the Supreme Court has defined it. Um, there are very few exceptions. Um, and defamation is an exception. I'm, a, I'm not a fan of that exception, frankly. But um, if you uh, say something um, about somebody that has uh, serious implications in their, uh, in their life, in their ability to earn a living, if you say you accuse somebody of being a pedophile when it's not true, th that person can sue you. Um, my own view is I think that's an unfortunate exception, but I'm not on the Supreme Court. Um, uh, I think that um, I, I'm, I'm with, uh, a friend of mine was Nat Hentoff. Nat Hentoff, who wrote for decades for the Village Voice in New York, um, he was a friend of mine. He was a free speech absolutist. And uh, he wrote a fabulous book called Free Speech for Me But Not for Thee. Hmm. Um, and he was an absolutist and I'm, I'm, with, I'm with Matt Hentoff. Even on the defamation aspect. I mean, I agree with you in some sense, just practically speaking, it seems like that the way, the best way in uh, the, the public sphere to defend against defamation is with more speech. Correct. And through authenticity, through authentic communication um, of the truth, as you see it. Yeah. You know, at times the Boston Globe has said something about me that hasn't been accurate. They have invariably published my letter to the editor. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also uh, not bashful about getting in, chart, in touch with the reporter. They, at the end of every column, they give the reporter's email address. Um and uh, I know people say that I I have more access to the media than most people, um, but um, all that means is I get the fame more than most people. Can we also comment on from the individual consumer of speech? There's a kind of uh, sense that freedom of speech means you you should be forced to read all of it. Freedom of speech versus freedom of reach. We as consumers of speech. Do we have the right to select what we read? We do. And um, n nobody can force us to sit in a room and listen to a radio program that we don't want to listen to. Nobody can force us to read a book that we don't want to read. Um, the whole notion of freedom of speech means that people have uh, autonomy on their choices. In order to form a complete mind, a complete human being, there's a kind of tension of that autonomy versus um, consuming as many varied perspectives as possible, which is underlying the ethic of free speech. So on college campuses, it seems like a good way to develop the mind is to get as many perspectives as possible, even if you don't really want to. Well, that's, that is the theory. Academic freedom is, the, is supposed to be <clears throat> the highest degree of free speech. Yeah. Um, you should be able to entertain uh, all kinds of uh, hateful, threatening ideas. And, and uh, the way I put it is, there's something wrong when you can say something with complete abandon, without any fear, in Harvard Square, whereas on the other side of the fence, you can't say it in Harvard Yard. It should be the opposite. And what happens is um, universities... Uh, from the best to the worst, from the most famous to the least well-known, have been taken over by administrators. Administrators do not really subsume academic values. They know nothing about the Constitution. They know nothing about free speech. They know nothing about academic freedom. They feel that their job is to keep order. And so they develop speech codes, kangaroo courts to enforce the speech codes, and these are very dire developments. I wrote about them in the Shadow University in 98 um, and tried to deal with them in 1999 when I started FIRE, co-started FIRE. And um, uh, I would FIRE, the reason I'm running currently for the Harvard Board of Overseers is 
What I'd like to do is convince the Harvard Corporation, the so-called president and fellows of Harvard College, the chief governing board of the university with the real power. Um, the Board of Overseers is a secondary body, but quite influential, uh, to fire 95% of the administrators. It would have a salutary effect on the academics of the university. It would have a salutary effect on free speech and academic freedom. It would cut tuitions by about 40%, um, and it would create a whole different atmosphere on the campus. And the same set of MIT or any other place. Um, I think administrators are a, uh, a, a very um, a, a bad uh, influence on American higher education. Can you sort of elaborate uh, the intuition of why this thing that you call uh, administrative bloat is such a bad thing for a university? So well, first of all, ju just in terms of the the, the cost of yeah. maintaining, there are more administrators in American higher education than there are faculty members. Yeah. The cost is enormous. Number two, they are uh, inimical to the uh, the uh, the teaching enterprise, and and um, they feel that their job is to control things, to make sure there are no problems and nobody's feelings are hurt. Um, uh, being called, you know, be, before a, a dean because you said something um, that insulted somebody is something that shouldn't happen in American higher education. Yet it happens because you have these administrators who think it's their job to protect people from being insulted. You, you, you insult a, a black student, you insult a woman, um, there's a disciplinary hearing. Well, there shouldn't be. Um, b black people uh, are accustomed to being insulted. Jews are accustomed to, accustomed to being insulted. Women are accustomed to being insulted. And it's very good to know who doesn't like you. It's useful. It is very, it's essential information to know who doesn't like you. If everybody is forced to say, I love you, and nobody can say, I hate you, you get a false view of what life is all about. Outside of the university. Outside the university. I mean, you, you do graduate eventually. And that's ultimately the mission of the university is to prepare you, to make you into a great human being, into a great leader that can take on the problems Correct. of the world. Correct. And you don't do it by by treating you like a like a little flower. But what role does the university have to protect students, to women, African Americans, anybody, Jews, anybody who gets can well, get, you, can be a victim of hate speech? They 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 protect you from physical assault. If somebody physically assaults you, then they um they, they get punished. But they shouldn't insult. They shouldn't protect you against insult because that is a violation of academic freedom, the freedom of the insulter to insult you. And also, as I said, it's very useful to know who doesn't like you. It's useful for the so-called victim. I think it's to say, I wanna know who doesn't like me. It's as important to me as knowing who, who likes me. But do you also believe in this open uh, space of discourse that the insulter will eventually lose? I think that's true. I think of the insulter eventually will wear out his or her welcome. Um, I do, but I, I like to know who the insulters are. Because it gives you a deeper understanding of human nature. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and usually, by the way, my experience has been that the insulters have generally not been as smart as the people they've insulted. Yeah, And that's probably one of the reasons they insult them, because they're, they feel inferior. Yeah, I mean, I'm not trying to be a... A, a psychoanalyst here, but a lot of the people who are the haters are pretty low down on the uh, intellectual scale. Anyway, 95% of administration, you would fire, you're calling to fire 95% of the administration. Correct. People should know, I think people that don't really think about the structure, the way the universities work are not familiar, I think, with the fact that administration, there's a huge bloat of administration. You know, when you think about what makes a great university, it's about the students, it's about the faculty, it's about the people that do research, if it's a research university. They don't think about the bureaucracy of meetings and committees and rules and paperwork and all that, and all the people that are involved with pushing that kind of paper. And there's a huge cost to that, but it also slows down 
and suppresses the, the beautiful variety that makes the university great, which is the teaching, the student life, the protests, the, 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 um, the clubs, all the fun that you can have in a university, all the very kind of exploration, which you can't really do once you graduate. Correct. It's the place, the university is a place to really explore mm -hmm. in, in every single way. So let me just talk about this important thing because uh, I'm very fortunate to have contacted you almost by accident in a very important moment in your life. You're running for the Harvard Board of Overseers. Uh, what is this board? How much power does it have? Uh, and what would you do if elected? Okay. First of all, I have, a, I have a prediction. Yes. That in about five years, they're going to probably change the name because overseers reminds people of the slavery era. Yes. And we're in a, such a politically correct era now that the English language is being restricted, corrupted is the way I put it, because certain words are, uh, are, are forbidden. We, we have some problems in this country, and I think part of the problem is the educational system has lost the sense of what academic freedom and free speech are all about. And, um, and, and um, I think it's uh, essential that uh, the educational system begin to take more seriously what free speech and academic freedom really are. That's why I'm running for the Harvard Board of Overseers. So let me just linger on the... Uh, the role of the administration in protecting free speech. So what often happens, I think you've written about this, is there's going to be a few, uh, maybe a small number of hypersensitive students and faculty that protest. So how does Harvard administration uh, resist the influence of those hypersensitive protesters in protecting uh, speech, in protecting even hate speech? Harvard has done fairly well under the presidency of Lawrence Bacow. I have had a couple of meetings with Bacow. Um, I like Bacow. I have donated to Harvard a print of my late, my late wife took a picture of Bob Dylan and Allen Ginsberg when the Rolling Thunder Review got to Harvard Square. And it's, a, it's sort of an iconic photograph. She called it the music lesson because it's got Dylan teaching Ginsburg how to play the guitar. And I donated one of those to, to Harvard. It's hanging in Backhouse office. He, the new president, Claudine Gay, is not known for respecting academic freedom and free speech. People have said to me, well, give her a chance. Well, I'll, I'm willing to give her a chance, but she does have a record. And uh, she's a bureaucrat. Um, I don't think she believes in free speech and academic freedom. I think she's a progressive, not a liberal. Um, I'm not happy with the uh, the, the, the appointment of uh, Claudine Gay, and it has made more essential my attempt to get on the Board of Overseers. So let's talk about the Board of Overseers and uh, your run for it, the specifics actually. Okay. It would be, be nice because I think you're a write-in candidate and the election is over on May 16th? Uh, yes. And I think there are specifics, I'll probably give them in the intro, I'll give links to people, but the specifics are complicated. Let me just mention that you have to be Harvard alumni, so have graduated from Harvard. You have to, in order to run and in order to vote. In order to vote. And the process, I imagine, is not trivial, but uh, it, this is done online, and if you're an alumni, you should have received an email from a particular email address, harvard at mgelectionservicescorp.com. And uh, presumably there's a way to get some validation number from that email, and then you go online, you enter that validation number and you vote. And you to vote for Harvey, you have to enter his name correctly, Harvey Silverglate, and spell it correctly. Correct. Um, obviously, I'm imagining this, because I'm MIT, not Harvard. So I'm imagining the process is not trivial. There's, you have to click on things, you have to uh, uh, sort of follow instructions that are not uh, uh, trivial. And uh, I'll also provide an email if the process is painful, it doesn't work for you, that you can email. Email Harvard and complain. IT help at harvard.edu and so on. I'll provide all the links. But is there something else you can say 
about the voting process, uh, what you're running on. This is my second run. Mm -hmm. The first time I got enough signatures to get on the ballot. Then the Harvard Alumni Association sent out a letter to all living Harvard alums recommending that they vote for the officially nominated candidates that excluded two petition candidates of whom I was one. And um, I wrote to the Alumni Association and I said, you have now sent out the curriculum vitae's and the policy positions of all the officially nominated candidates. There are two petition candidates on the ballot. I would like to be able to send out my positions to the voters. They wrote me back saying, our policy is to only send out the policy positions and the platforms of officially nominated candidates. Can you believe that? Well, this is a liberal arts college, right? Um, from the Where from the clash of ideas, truth emerges. Well, really? This is what I call Harvard's not so subtle means of candidate suppression, not voter suppression, candidate suppression. And um, everybody can vote, but not everybody can run. Uh, it, is, it'll bec it'll becomes a liberal arts college where, you know, the clash of ideas will produce the truth. Well, what about the clash of ideas on the board of overseers? The board of overseers is important. It doesn't have the same power and authority as the Harvard Corporation, the so-called president and fellows of Harvard College. But it's very influential and um, very important. And it would be a great perch for me to try to exert influence for the university to get back to where it was before it was taken over by the administrators. Well, I'm pretty sure that most of Harvard alumni, most of the students currently going to Harvard, most of the faculty at Harvard probably stand behind the ideas and the ideals that you stand behind. Yep. The, the people that love Harvard and what it stands for. So yeah, the alumni were educated in an era when these concepts were taken more seriously. And before the administration, administrators took over. So I do think if I get my message out, I'm gonna win a seat. And if I win a seat, uh, I will have a great perch for, for, for trying to convince the real power that be, which is the Harvard Corporation, to do the things that I'm suggesting. You know, get rid of 95% of the administrators, get rid of the speech codes, reduce tuition by 40%. Uh, all of these salutary benefits. Uh, can you imagine if Harvard became the most affordable college in the United States? Well, the affordability is another aspect, but I think before that, the uh, just the freedom of expression, freedom of speech, freedom of thought yeah, at have, America's greatest universities, I think is something that everybody would agree on. It, it would have a, it would have a, a, a tremendous effect on the, the whole country. <sighs> And uh, is there something to say about the details of uh, how difficult it is f for alumni to vote? Well, you have experience with this? The, the, you could uh, vote online or you can vote by paper ballot. You could request a paper ballot. Um, and all I could say is that the, the hard part is getting the message out. Um, my name doesn't appear on the ballot because I couldn't get enough signatures. Um, well, Harvey, Harvey Silverglate. S-I-L-V-E-R-G-L-A-T. You know, when my grandparents arrived from Russia, yeah. um, the, uh, the, the, the name in Russian was something like Zilbaglit. Yeah. And the immigration officer had several choices. He could have said silver gate. Yeah. Gate is a real, silver and gate are real English words. Yeah. He could have said silver glade, G-L-A-D-E. Those are real English words. That's how my name is often misspelled, either Silver Gate or Silver Glade. Mm -hmm. Silver Glade is a nonsense syllable. And why the immigration officer chose to transliterate Silver Zilberglit as Silver Glade, I will never understand. And it is the cause of endless mistakes in my name. Well, the, uh, the fundamental absurdity of life yes. is also the source of its beauty. 
Yes. Anyway, we shall spell it out and we shall get uh, yell loud and uh, wide that everybody who has ever graduated from Harvard should vote for you if they believe in the ideals of the great American universities, which I think most people do. Let me also ask about uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity programs. You've been, you've had a few harsh words to say about those. You know, the idea of diversity, I think, is a beautiful idea. Uh, you've said that Harvard's idea of diversity is for everyone to look different and think alike. Correct. Can you elaborate? And, and be comfortable. And be comfortable. Yeah. First of all, it is impossible, if liberal arts education is taken seriously, it's impossible for students to feel comfortable. Why? Because one of the roles of college is to challenge all the beliefs that they grew up with, which mostly are the beliefs inculcated by parents and by elementary school teachers. And um, the idea is to be able to challenge those thoughts, those ideas. And if you don't have free speech and academic freedom, those views get reified, they do not get challenged. So it's, it, is, it, it, it violates the fundamental role of higher educational institutions to have any restrictions at all. That's number one. Number two, as I think I said earlier, if people, if students are not allowed to be frank with one another, they don't really learn about one another. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, I, I've given a lot of lectures in which I have said, and, and I think students now understand it, I'm much more interested in hearing from the people who hate me than the people who love me. I'm much more interested in knowing who disagrees with me than people who agree with me. That's how I learn, and that's how they learn, the clash of ideas, which is the theory behind the First Amendment. That truth will somehow emerge, or if not truth, at least a better truth, a truer truth, a more useful truth, if ideas are allowed to clash. Especially in the structure of a university where uh, at least I would say there's some set of rules, some set of civility. I think I would rather read Mein Kampf to understand people that hate. There is also a quality uh, to disagreement that we should strive for. And I think a university is a place where when uh, disagreement and even hate is allowed, it's done in a high effort way. You know, somebody asked me once about what books I would want to have as required reading in in, in literature courses, and I listed Mein Kampf, and they were horrified. And I said, well, it's one of the most important books of the 20th century. Yeah. I mean, six million Jews died, an enormous number of other people died, because one guy wrote a book called Mein Kampf and took it seriously. It's one of the most important books ever written. How can, how can an educated person not have at least breezed through Mein Kampf? And, um, it's not a great read, though. It's not problem. a great read. He was not a great writer. But you, you, you do get a sense for the the sociopath that was Adolf Hitler. Yes, because he really acted on the words that he wrote. Yeah. And it was there. And if people took that work seriously. Correct. They, they would have understood. It's the, one of the uh, most important books of the 20th century. And it's politically incorrect to read it. It's crazy. But can you... Uh, speak to the um, the efforts to increase diversity in universities, which I think is embodied in this uh, DIE effort of diversity, inclusion, and equity programs. Where do they go right? Where do they go wrong? Okay, let me tell you, first of all, th this may surprise a lot of people. I am opposed to affirmative action. Um, and I think that um, what it does is it labels people by their race, by their religion, and by their national origin. Precisely what we don't want people to do is be pigeonholed in those categories. The reason that affirmative action has become the way that universities decide on who gets admitted is because historically, people in what's called marginalized groups, 
blacks, gays, Hispanics have been discriminated against in the admissions process. Now, what I have suggested is that instead of affirmative action, and by the way, uh, here's a prediction. The Supreme Court is going to abolish affirmative action. There's a case pending, a Harvard case. Um, it's, there's a, there are two cases joined together, one of a public university and one of a private university. The private university is Harvard. Uh, I, I predict that the Supreme Court will vote six to three to abolish affirmative action. Uh, it is on its face, it is a violation of equal protection of the law. Some groups are favored because of race or ethnicity. It is a classic violation of equal protection clause. When affirmative action was approved, the deciding vote was Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. She wrote a very famous opinion in which she said, um, I hesitate to vote to, up, to keep up, you know, to affirm the notion of affirmative action because it's such an obvious violation of equal protection. But we have an urgent problem in the society. We are not educating our um, uh, members of racial and ethnic minorities, and we have to try to get them into our colleges. Um, so I'm, I think it should be approved for 25 years, um, and um, it will, uh, it should be, it, it should, in 25 years, it should have performed its role. Well, it hasn't. And um, the 25 years is coming up. I think it's three or four years left. The Supreme Court is going to abolish it. You can take my word for that. Because it's such an obvious violation of equal protection. Why do why did affirmative action come into play? Because the secondary and elementary schools are so bad. Public, secondary, and elementary schools are so bad. Why are they so bad? Partly because of the control that the teachers' union has. Randy Weingarten runs the public school system in the United States. And what I have suggested is that the effort should be to, uh, uh, this is an emergency, it's a national emergency, to in, improve the quality of elementary and secondary education. And one way to do it is to hire teachers who are fabulous teachers rather than necessarily members of the union. Mm -hmm. I have come to oppose public workers' unions. I am a very strong supporter of unions in the private sector. Why do I think there's such a difference between unions in the public sector and the private sector? In the private sector, management is arguing, bargaining with its own money and with the money of shareholders. In the public sector, there's only one side. There is the teachers' union, and then there's a school committee that is dealing with the taxpayers' money, not their own. And so it's a very skewed power balance. So as supportive as I am of private sector unions, I am in a opposition of public sector unions. They're very destructive. And I think without teachers' union, teachers who are really skilled will be able to get jobs they would not have to worry about the seniority of teachers who long since have given up really creative teaching. Uh, and we have to improve the public educational system. Um, I had, um, in, in, in my late wife and I, um, uh, had a, a classmate of, we have a son who's now 44 who went to the public schools in Cambridge. Um, he has a, a friend first name Eugene, who was a black kid from Roxbury, whose mother understood that the schools in Roxbury were terrible, the schools in Cambridge were pretty good. He lived in our house Monday to Friday, and he went to school with Isaac in the Cambridge Public Schools. Mm -hmm. Elsa and I would show up the school committee meetings when there was bargaining between the teachers' union mm -hmm. and the school committee. Um, 
the teachers union objected to our being there. We argued we're taxpayers. We have a, a, a kid in the school, and we have his, his best friend lives with us and goes to school with him. Oh, we have a real interest. And um, the school committee walked out of the bargaining session. The city council then reconsidered its vote, and they voted that we that citizens, taxpayers, parents of kids in the school could not show up to these negotiation sessions. I thought that was absolutely outrageous. But I understood why, because these contracts are crazy. No sane municipality should enter into some of these contracts. Um, and um, so I am a, um, uh, I have become an opponent of the National Teachers Association, the Cambridge Teaching, Cambridge Teachers Association. I don't think there should be unions for public employees because there's no real bargaining going on. And um, I think that the public school system will never be improved as long as the, the, the teachers are unionized. So that, to you, is at the core of the problem that results in uh, the kind of inequality of opportunity that uh, affirmative action is designed Correct. to solve. If so the, if, you, if the educational system in the elementary and high school levels is improved, we wouldn't need affirmative action. These kids would get good educations. So from all backgrounds, poor kids in the United States will get good education Correct. if uh, uh, public unions are abolished. Correct. Yeah, but do you more? And incidentally, the postal service would probably work better too. <laughs> That's a whole other conversation. Yes. But do you, at the core of the problem of the inequality in, in universities, that uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity programs are trying to solve is the public education system correct. of secondary education. Yes, correct. Elementary yeah. and secondary. Elementary and secondary education. Well, then, is there use? What is the benefit? What is the drawback of uh, DIE, diversity, inclusion, and equity programs at universities like Harvard? It's an affirmative action, basically. Okay. And what it does is it allows the system of uh, elementary and secondary education to be bad because they could say, oh, we get our kids into Harvard. Yes, but you haven't educated them. And it, it covers up the wound. And I think we will never improve as long as we're able to cover up the wound. And as I said, affirmative action is going to be abolished by the Supreme Court. It's a clear violation of equal protection. It's what Sandra Day O'Connor understood but ignored intentionally, but as an experiment. Uh, and um, I believe it's going to be abolished, and that's going to have that's going to force the elementary and high schools to get serious. Do you see the same issues that you discuss now at Harvard, uh, at MIT? We're here in Boston, so I have to talk about the the great universities here in Boston. You've written about MIT. I'm uh, it's the university I love. I'm a research scientist there. Um, do you see the same kind of issues there? Yes, I do. Do you remember? Can you explain the case of Dorian Abbott lecture that was canceled at MIT? Yeah, well, it, it, you know, it's this. This is not the only. It's not the only incident. Um, there have been incidents all around the country um, of, of, of academics, professors who have views that don't comport with the, uh, as the great Lillian Hellman, another friend of my late wife, said they, uh, they, they, she said she refused to cut her garments in order to fit the fashions of the day. Um, Dorian Abbott didn't cut his suit um, to fit the fashions of the day, in his intellectual suit. And so he was, um, this has happened at Princeton, this has happened at Harvard, this has happened at MIT. The great universities in the country um, have decided that the clash of ideas is not such a good idea because some people's feelings will be hurt. Well, this is, there was quite a revolt against it. Um, fire uh, sounded the uh, alarm. And then in the end, the universities were, uh, I, I believe Abbott was invited to come back. I think he turned them down. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, his, I, he, he shouldn't have turned him down, but he did. Um, and um, when, when the light is cast upon these situations, the universities back down because they're so embarrassed. Yeah. Um, and the newspapers, because newspapers depend on the First Amendment in order to exist, Newspapers tend to give pretty good publicity to these cases of censorship. So they grill the universities. Yes. Uh, so they, they really emphasize, they catalyze the embarrassment. Yes. So is that one of the ways, is that the best way to fight all of this? Yes. Sunshine is the best disinfectant. Uh, you've written about MIT's connection to Jeffrey Epstein. Yes. He was well-connected at MIT and at Harvard. Um, what do you, what lessons do you draw? about human nature, about universities, about all of this from, from this saga. Let me say this. I believe that universities, if somebody was to, for example, donate to a university and donates on the requirement that the building be named after them, mm -hmm. if the university is taking do donations and the person is funding a building and wants the building named after them, the building should be named after him, him or them. Mm -hmm. Harvard is facing this now with the Sackler building mm -hmm. because Sackler, the Sacklers have become now a persona non grata because of their role in producing the opioids that caused the huge, scandalous opioid addiction. There are people who want to have removed the name the Sackler from the Sackler Art Museum at Harvard. Larry Bacow, the president of Harvard, to his credit, has refused to, to do that. Um, and um, if it reminds people that the money was earned through selling opioids, that's good. That's good that people understand that that's where the Sacklers got their money. They should be reminded. In my, in, in, in my um, uh, undergraduate alma mater, Princeton, there's a movement to remove the name Woodrow Wilson because Whit Wilson was president of Princeton before he became governor of New Jersey, before he became president of the United States. How he got to be governor of New Jersey was he was so insufferable that the trustees of Princeton got him the nomination to run for governor of New Jersey. They had said, we gotta get this guy out of here. Um, and um, not because he was anti-black and anti-Semitic, because the trustees were as well, but because he just was insufferable. He drove the faculty crazy. And uh, they got him out. Um, and um, so uh, Princeton was thinking of changing the name. I wrote a letter to President Eisgruber at Princeton saying, you know, the, the, this is part of the university's history. You don't want to, you want to rewrite history falsely? Uh, Woodrow Wilson was the president of this institution. He was one of your predecessors. He never answered me either. Um, I think these people, you know, they, they know they have no answer. The reason I didn't get a response from President Eisgruber is the same as the reason I didn't get a response from the headmaster of Milton Academy. They understand that what they're doing is violative of the fundamental precepts of academic institutions. Yeah. They're ashamed they, that they feel they have no choice because they feel that they would be criticized for racism, homophobia, blah, 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 blah. Criticized by how many people? Well, they feel that they would be criticized by students and parents and donors. I disagree with that. I actually think there are more people out there that agree with me than agree with them. Yeah, by a large margin. By a large margin in what I call the real world, which is the world outside the campus. But academics are afraid they'd be criticized. They're incredibly thin-skinned. When I say academics, I mean academic administrators. They're very thin-skinned, politically correct, holier than thou. Um, as I said, I would fire 90, 95% of them, and I would be more um, careful in who I elected to lead these institutions. So I said Pauline Gay is probably going to be a disaster at Harvard. So it takes guts, it takes courage to be in the administration when the task of protecting the freedom of speech is there. Yeah. And also, um, which in part requires you to admit and to uphold the mistakes you have done in the past. Correct. Not to hide them. Correct. And that to, to you, I mean, Jeffrey Epstein for Harvard and for MIT is a very recent mistake. Well, there's a debate whether it's a mistake. They took money from him. Yes. Okay. 
Is it a mistake to take money from bad people? Do you have to do a morals test of a potential donor? I don't think so. Um, it's there, complicated because... If there are no conditions attached to it, I think it's emotionally complicated. I don't think that it is rationally complicated. Um, it's emotionally complicated. It's particularly complicated if they want naming rights. Yes. You know, the Jeff, Jeffrey Epstein Biological Laboratory, um, that, that would be a problem for most universities. Um, I don't think that uh, naming rights have to be given to somebody that you, that you don't think is worthy of having their name. I think the university has the right to say, no, we'll, we'll take your money, but we will not name the building after you. I think they have a right to do that. There's some degree in which you whitewash the name, though. If you, not, not, not with naming rights, but if you, take you, the money? if you take the money, it allows the person in uh, public discourse to say that they're collaborating, they're working together with Harvard and with MIT. Well, I have a problem with universities making morals tests of, sure. of donors because not every donor is as bad as Epstein, but some of the donors made their money in industry by being rapacious, uh, by uh, paying low wages, uh, by exploiting people. You can uh, make the case that uh, accepting money from the Department of Defense, from DARPA, uh, from the United States organizations that uh, contributed to waging war and killing hundreds of thousands of civilians over the past few decades. Correct. Um, folks like the tenured professor Noam Chomsky who make the case that that is far more evil than um, accepting money from Jeffrey Epstein. Yes. Still, Jeffrey Epstein is a known pedophile. Yes. So that's why I say I would I would not give him naming rights. I think the university has the autonomy to not give naming rights, but I think that giving morals tests to donors is a is, is a Pandora's box. What do you think about the aftermath of the Jeffrey Epstein saga? It feels like uh, I'm not familiar with Harvard's response, uh, but MIT's response seemed to um, fire a few scapegoats, and it didn't seem like a genuine response. Uh, to the evils that uh, human beings are capable of, sort of like rising to the surface, the description in a fully transparent way of all the interactions that happened with Jeffrey Epstein and what that means. Um, yeah, what, what that means about the, the role of money in universities, what that means about just human well, beings in power. Money, money is essential to run a university. Yeah. One of the reasons it's essential is because the university is artificially, artificially requires huge amounts of money, and that's partly because of the administrative army that they, that they, they uh, yeah. support. And they would be less dependent on the Jeffrey Epsteins of the world if they didn't have, the, the, so it's sort of all part of the same circle. So but, the, but there's a tension here. You're saying we shouldn't be putting a morals test on money but actually, if you make, uh, if you expand the amount of money needed to run the university, this, you're going to make less and less, uh, more and more unethical decisions Correct. in terms of accepting money. And as I said, I, I, I am flexible enough to say that I don't think I would name a building after somebody who is truly evil. I think the university has the, has the right to limit the naming rights on a, for a donor. Um, if I was an absolutist, I would, don't even say that, but I'm, I'm not an absolutist. Um, I, I have my limits, and that's one of them. The, the, the Jeffrey Epstein Biological Laboratory, it's a little bit much. It feels like there should be a requirement on, there should be moral requirements on who to accept money from. But the question is, the, th the concern you have is about who gets to decide, and what's the alternative? Correct, I think there is no alternative I think that turning down a donation because you, you you don't approve of the conduct of the donor is a Pandora's box. But I'm just sickened by the fact that an evil human being was allowed to walk in the halls of a university I love. 
So what do we do with that? Well, are you telling me that none of the students are evil? Are you telling me none of the faculty members are evil? Are you telling me some, none of the administrators are evil? Um, but that doesn't, sure, sure. So uh, saying, scapegoating, saying that Jeffrey Epstein is evil can help us forget, can aid us in forgetting that there is other evil in the world and uh, some of it might be roaming still the halls of MIT and Harvard. Hey, listen, I won't tell you the name, but I represented somebody in the MIT administration a few years ago uh, who, was, who was charged with uh, sexual improprieties against students. Yeah. Um, and uh, as a lawyer, I represented that person. Um, uh, people say to me, how could you represent you know, some, some of the people I represent are bad people. Say, how can you represent them? I say, well, if I was a cardiologist and this person had a heart attack on the street and I didn't deliver CPR, I would be have my license taken away. I'm a lawyer. The only difference between my obligation and the doctor's obligation is the Constitution gives people the right to assistance of counsel. They don't have... This Constitution says nothing about the assistance of cardiologists. I have a very high duty to represent unpopular people. Well, I think as I apply the same test to the college donors. Um, the university should not have a morals test. Um, to, who's money to take? Um, I, I, I do draw a line about naming rights of buildings. Um, and as I say, that's an inconsistency with my absolutism. But I just, emotionally, I just can't deal with having, you know, the, as I said, the Jeffrey Epstein Biological Laboratory. Well, for me, emotionally, there's nothing that sickens me more in the university than the abuse of power. Right, and there's an awful lot of people who abuse power at the university. And especially when it comes to abuse power over students. Correct. So, so sexual harassment, so in the realm of sexual abuse of power, and uh, all kinds of other. Well, this is a crime. Power to use one's power position in order to take sexual advantage of a student. It's a crime. Yeah. Um, this is not a close question. Yeah, but it, there's a legal crime and there's a deeply ethical crime and there's an emotional response that I have. You are a good lawyer and perhaps a good man to want to defend some folks who are evil in this world. I don't think I have that emotional fortitude. Well, then you shouldn't be a criminal defense lawyer or a cardiologist. <laughs> I think you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still deeply sickened by Jeffrey Epstein and uh, the faculty, the administration that still might be in these great American universities that are abusing their power in small ways and big ways. But that's human nature. You get a little bit of power and you're a bad man or a bad woman and you take advantage of it. Yep. We see that in the smallest of ways and in the biggest of ways in uh, institutions and regimes all across the world. Ah, oh, boy, Harvey, it's a complicated situation. Well, it's a complicated world and it's complicated to be a human being and this is nothing new. <laughs> and we should talk about it uh, without restriction. All right, just to linger on liberal arts, in uh, 2014 and probably still today, you wrote that liberals are killing the liberal arts. Yes. So can you explain? Yes, the problem with, I'm a political liberal. Mm -hmm. The problem with the, the, the political left is that it has divided between what's called progressives and liberals. Liberals are people of the left who believe in the First Amendment, an absolute First Amendment and in due process of law. And um, the, the problem with what progressives now, in the pursuit of equality, what they view as equality, they're willing to bend those rules. And this movement actually started in Brandeis. Um, the, um, the critical, it's the critical race theory uh, it started Herbert Marcuse was a professor at Brandeis, and he came up with his theory. The theory was this. Now, this is right out of Orwell. In order to create true equality in a society where you have some downtrodden and some who are the ubermenschen, in order to create real um, equality, you have to reduce 
the rights of the upper classes and artificially increase the rights of the lower classes. And um, that will produce, a, out, of, out of unequal treatment, true equality will be, will, will be attained. This is nonsense. The idea of discrimination producing true equality is nonsense. My view is, as I've said earlier in our discussion, that the way to um, increase the opportunities for the lower classes is to give them real educations. And until we do that, it's not going to happen. And in order to do that, we have to overcome um, the problem of the teachers' unions at the elementary and secondary school levels. Until we're willing to do that honestly and improve those schools, we're going to have a problem of a large number of uneducated people who need a boost because we haven't given them proper educations. What do you think about some of the more controversial faculty in the world? So uh, an example, somebody I've spoken with many times uh, on mic and offline is Jordan Peterson. I'm not sure if you're familiar with his work. Yes. But he is an outspoken critic of, uh, or proponent of free speech on campus, and he's been attacked quite a bit. He's a controversial figure. Um, what's the role of the university to protect the Jordan Petersons of the world? I think a university has an absolute, absolute, not, not relative, not more that absolute role, obligation to protect the academic freedom of even the most controversial faculty members. Um, and um, you can imagine on a university campus, you have more people who are outliers than you do in the general population. Um, and um, that's the hope at least. Hopefully, yeah. And, and, um, and, and those outliers have to be protected. Um, they can't be pressured, they can't be fired, they can't be disabled from spewing their their views, whether they're considered racist, whether they're considered to be, uh, you know, a, a promote an idea of uh, human society that's considered obnoxious. Um, it, it doesn't matter. If you can't, if, if you can't have freedom of thought on the college campuses, where can you? You know, then we're lost. As a society, we're lost. And as an educational institution, um, educational institutions no longer will educate, they will indoctrinate. That we have to avoid at all costs. And we should also remember that the outlier might also be the only bearer of truth. So in Nazi Germany, speaking against the fascism, fascist regime, in uh, communist Soviet Union, speaking against communism, they might hold the key to the solving the, uh, the ailments of that society. Oh, absolutely. And some of the most important discoveries in science, for example, yes. were, um, were uh, mocked yeah. at the beginning. I mean, think of poor Charlie Darwin. <laughs> Charlie, <laughs> I see he is on nickname uh, yeah. <laughs> levels with you. Uh, well, because we're, we're, we're talking about these big topics of sexism, racism, and hate. We should not forget about the smaller topics, which might even have the much bigger impact, which is what you're speaking to, which is uh, outlier uh, ideas in science. So basically welping, welcoming controversial ideas in science. And by controversial, I mean, just stuff that, that uh, most of the community doesn't agree on. It doesn't actually harm anyone at all. But even then there's always pressure. Uh, one of the things I'm really concerned about is how little power young faculty have, that there's a kind of hierarchy, seniority, that's uh, that universities have, empowered by the administration, where young faculty that come in, they're kind of... Uh, Pre-tenure. Pre pre, yeah, there, there's, a, there's a process in chasing tenure where you're kind of supposed to behave, and there's an uh, incentive to kind of fit in and to not be an outcast. And that that's a really huge problem because Oftentimes, the youth is when the craziest, the biggest ideas, the revolutionary ideas come. And if you're forced to behave and fit in and not speak out, then even in the realm of science, the the innovation is stifled. Well, now you now you trigger my uh, 
I'm happy Uh-oh. to tell you this story. So you're triggered. This is good. <laughs> In the mid 1980s, I decided to take a four month sabbatical from my law practice. Yes. Professor James Vorenberg, who was at the time dean of the Harvard Law School, heard about it. Heard about it from his wife, Elizabeth Betty Vorenberg, whom I was very friendly with because we were both on the ACLU, the ACLU of Massachusetts board at the time. And um, so Betty told Jim that Harvey was taking a sabbatical. Jim called Harvey and asked Harvey if he would like to teach a course at the Harvard Law School because there was nobody who had t- teaching criminal law from the perspective of somebody who actually was in court, litigated. It was all theoretical. I said, sure, I'll do it. So I taught a semester at Harvard Law School. The student evaluations were fabulous. Why? Because it was really interesting. They were hearing a lawyer who was talking about real cases. I actually brought in a few of my clients to some of the classes. And um, so Jim called me and said, Harvey, the students love this course. I'd like to offer you a tenure track position at the law school. You'd have to give up your law practice. I turned him down. He said, did you just say no? I said, yes, I said no. He said, how come? He says, nobody ever has ever, in my administration, has ever turned down a tenure track offer at Harvard Law School. I said, because I could see that I'm not a good fit, that the administrators are overrun the place, that faculty members, especially untenured, are afraid to say things that might not get help them in the tenure quest. Um, it's uh, I'm, I'm, it's not a good fit for me. I you was, saw this in the mid-1980s already. Yes, about 1985. And um, I went back to my law practice. I, I did not want to get into this meat grind that, that I saw. After all, I, had, I started to see it before the turn of the century because I co-authored the Shadow University in 98. And then co-founded Fire in '99. I, I'm an early student of this phenomenon. What are some other aspects of this, uh, the book, The Shadow University, that we may have not covered? Well, let me let me tell you a story. I believe I tell it in The Shadow University because it was part of. I'm loving these stories, Harvey. The stories are fabulous. <laughs> let, let me tell you a story of. Um, um, I, I I I did a tour of the country, go visiting campuses. Mm-hmm. I visited a college called Hamline University. I believe it was in Indiana or Illinois, somewhere in the Midwest. And I I attended a freshman orientation. Mm-hmm. Now listen to this. This was a freshman orientation. The administrators, the deans and the deanettes and the deputy assistant deans and deanettes and the de- third deputy assistant deans and deanettes Line the students up according to their skin hues. Oh, boy. The the blonde, blue-eyed, white folks were at one end. The darkest, um, you know, African-Americans who had, whose bloodlines had not yet mixed with any of the whites on the, one, the other end. And the exercise was you had to tell how your race affected your success in life up until that point. I thought it was the most demeaning thing that I could imagine. Demeaning. I thought to myself, they could do the same about sexual orientation. They could do the same about religion. They could do the same about national origin. It would be demeaning no matter what. Yeah. And, and the students actually verbalized how their race had either been a plus or a minus. They did it. They did. And I thought it was so demeaning, it just confirmed all of my distaste for this kind of, uh, this kind of approach. Uh, let me ask you from the interviewer seat. So I get to do this podcast, and I often have to think about giving a large platform and having a conversation with very controversial figures. And the the level of controversy has been slowly increasing. Uh, what's the role 
of this medium to to you, uh, this medium of speech between two people and me speaking with a controversial figure, me or some other interviewer, what's the role of uh, giving platform to controversial figures? Say members uh, of the KKK or dictators, uh, people who are seen as evil. Well, we want to face the world with reality. And the reality is that there are some unpleasantness, unpleasantnesses in the world. You know, running from genocide right through to ordinary discrimination, um, to offensiveness. It's the real world as we, we know it exists. Are we afraid to say it? Do we want to make people think that we live in a world where those words are not used, where those animosities don't exist? Um, the answer is no. But you can whitewash, you can normalize the use of those words, and you can whitewash the uh, acceptability of certain leaders. So for example, interviewing Hitler in 1938, 1935, 1936, 1937, 38, those are all different dynamics there. But you can normalize this person and in so doing create enormous harm. Well, see, I don't see it as normalizing. I see it as exposing. If more people had taken Mein Kampf seriously, um, Franklin Roosevelt would have acted much sooner. Uh, he only got us into the war, uh, asked Congress to get us into the war, when the Japanese made the mistake of attacking Pearl Harbor. Um, but there were some people in the State Department, there were some people in the administration who were trying trying to get Roosevelt to see what Hitler was really like, and he was blind to it. And this was one of the greatest presidents the United States ever had. He was blind to it until the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. So I think that words, unpleasant ideas, as expressed by words, are essential for communicating fact and truth and reality. And that's why I think that we should not whitewash language. We should not whitewash the fact that Jeffrey Epstein was pretty close to MIT. And Harvard. And Harvard. Um, and um, you know, reality, reality actually means something. Yeah, but from the role of the interviewer, that's something I have to think a lot about. Whether interviewing Hitler, you said exposing. I think it's hard to know what Hitler's like in a room, but uh, it's also hard to know, I've never met Jeffrey Epstein, it's hard to know what Jeffrey Epstein's like in a room, but I imagine to some degree they're charismatic figures. So exposing them, in the interview setting is not an easy task. Well, interviewing is not a, an easy All right. job. Yeah. Um, it's, <laughs> it's not a good idea to have an interview would be an idiot. <laughs> I know exactly what you're saying and I know why you're looking at me directly as you say it. I appreciate that, Harvey. All right. <laughs> Let me ask about your, your friend, your colleague, uh, Alan Dershowitz. And I'll also ask about your review of his most recent book. But before then, it'd be interesting um, to ask what you think of him as a human being, as, as a lawyer. He's a quite an interesting case. He's represented some of the most controversial figures in history. Including Jeffrey Epstein. Including Jeffrey Epstein, Mike Tyson, Julian Assange, Jim Baker, and uh, Jeffrey Epstein, and even Donald Trump. So he's an interesting figure. What do you think about that? Klaus von Bülow. What do you think? What do you think about uh, him as a human being, as a lawyer, what he represents in terms of values and ideals? Well, he's a criminal defense lawyer. And the, the job of a criminal defense lawyer is to represent accused criminals. Uh, he, he, he is a lifelong Democrat. He didn't represent Trump because he agrees with him politically. Voted for Hillary, I believe you wrote. He voted for Hillary, yes. That's what he says, and I absolutely believe it. He's a... He's a liberal Democrat, um, but he's a criminal defense lawyer as well as a professor. And um, I've represented some very nasty people uh, in, in my career. Um, I, I wouldn't go out for coffee with them, but they have the constitutional rights to representation. And you take that very seriously. Yes. You notice something that people don't understand about Dershowitz. 
He was asked by Trump to represent him in the second impeachment as well. Mm -hmm. He turned him down. Why do you think he turned it down? So people should know he represented Trump in the first impeachment trial. He represented him only in the first. And he was successful. And when Trump was impeached the second time, he asked Allen to represent him. Allen has had a lifelong policy of only representing somebody once, never twice. Why? Because he never wanted to be house counsel to the mafia. And so he early on had this position only represent somebody once. The mafia wants a lawyer who's an in-house counsel who represents them in all their cases. So that's the reason. And Alan never publicly explained it. I know it's a fact because I've known him from the day that we met at Harvard Law School, 1964. He was a first-year professor. I was a first-year student. We both had Brooklyn accents and we hit it off. We've, we've been close friends ever since. So there's some kind of unethical line that's crossed when you continuously represent a, uh, a client. Yeah, he thought it, it was not so much an ethical line. You have a right to represent mafia people, but he didn't want to be house counsel. He didn't want to be, you know, have them ask him for advice in advance of what they were doing. Yeah, He, he was willing to represent somebody who wants, no matter how awful. I mean, Klaus von Bülow was accused of killing his wife, these are pretty nasty people, um, but he didn't want to be house counsel to any of them. So you wrote a review of Alan Dershowitz's new book yes. on Donald Trump. The title of that book is Get Trump, The Threat to Civil Liberties, Due Process, and Our Constitutional Rule of Law. Can you summarize this book and your review of it? Yes, by the way, I co-authored it with my research assistant who's sitting right here. Emily. Yes. Um, and um, I thought that the book was another example of the fact that everybody is entitled to a defense and that um, Allen's um, being involved with Trump was purely professional. It was not political. It was not philosophical. And I thought that the fact that he was being um, uh, criticized, he was being shunned, uh, because of his connection to Trump, I found it very interesting that this is a guy who represented such, um, I call them distasteful figures, as Klaus von Bülow, uh, as uh, um, Mike Tyson, uh, as uh, O.J. Simpson, as Sheldon Siegel. Uh, and when he was considered to be um, a skillful lawyer, made his reputation. And then he represents uh, Donald Trump, who, to my knowledge, never killed anybody. Um, and he's suddenly shunned. I thought the hypocrisy of it, the political preening, mm -hmm. was um, very distasteful to me. Um, and it was not only because he was my friend. If he wasn't my friend, I think I'd have the same view. Um, the holier-than-thou nonsense, uh, the hypocrisy of it. Um, you know, they wouldn't talk to him about Martha's Vineyard now. Alan and I are different. I'm not so sensitive. I'm, if someone doesn't want to talk to me, no problem, no problem at all. Um, but Alan is, considering how controversial his life has been, is somewhat sensitive. He's somewhat sensitive. And I've kept telling Alan, you know, Alan, don't let it get to you. You know, hey, I can relate. I can I can definitely relate. Taking on some controversial conversations, still wear my heart on my sleeve. It hurts. All of it hurts. Yep. But maybe the pain makes you a better uh student of human nature. Yep. Maybe that's the case for him. Nevertheless, the book has a makes a a complicated and I think an interesting point. He opens the pair he opens the book with now that Donald Trump has announced his candidacy for re-election as president, the unremitting efforts by his political opponents to, quote, get him, to stop him from running at any cost will only increase. These efforts may pose the most significant threat to civil liberty since McCarthyism. So is he right? He's absolutely right. Because these attempted, the, for example, the prosecution, the, the one prosecution that has been brought now, Alvin Bragg, in, in the Manhattan. I have looked at that, and I don't believe that Trump has committed a crime. And yet, 
Bragg was pressured to bring that people in his office were threatening to quit if he didn't indict. Wholly improper, wholly unethical. Um, and he's going to lose the case. Has Trump committed crimes? Yes. Most of the tax crimes. Um, if his, uh, he has cheated on taxes his whole career, as far as I can tell. He could easily be indicted for state and federal taxes, but those not, they're not as sexy. And um, I think that um, he's become a target um, by ambitious politicians, ambitious prosecutors. He has gotten some sympathy, which he doesn't deserve. And um, a lot of it is, is pardon the phrase, political correctness. The better people are not supposed to be Trumpers. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had an interesting experience about Trump. I had two interesting experiences. The more recent one was I was in the house of um, Lawrence Summers, the former president of Harvard, who was driven out by political correctness, by the way. He mm -hmm. insulted women biologists. Um, I was in his house when he, he was still president of Harvard, uh, when uh, the Trump-Hillary Clinton contest took place. And I was with Elsa. Um, we were invited to Summer's house in Brookline. And um, it looked like Hillary was going to win. And the Harvard faculty members, they were all celebrating. They were all figuring out what their cabinet positions were going to be, blah, 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 blah. And then about 11.30 at night, all of a sudden it was announced that in terms of electoral votes, Trump had just eked out of victory, that Hillary beat him in the popular vote, but he had won the electoral college. And um, there was an immediate depression. And um, that Me was- Meaning of like quiet over the room. The room became absolutely stone silent. And they, they were all, uh, you know, disappointed. Well, that was a memorable moment. And it, it told me that they were a little bit too overconfident. Um, they, they were um, savoring uh, being part of a presidential administration. Uh, ambition had been thwarted. Uh, I'm not a great fan of uh, preening ambition. I think it blinds people to realities. And the resulting arrogance from such ambition. And the arrogance, yes. It's one of the reasons I didn't accept Jim Vorenberg's offer to be part of the academic community. I mean, I represent professors, I have friends who are professors, I represent students, I have friends who are students. Um, and uh, I have a great regard for universities and higher education, um, but I was not about to become part of the culture. I thought that it was not good for me and not good for the institution either. That can, uh, a culture that can breed arrogance. Yes. Uh, Self-importance. Yep. And uh, in a sense, the election of Donald Trump was a big F you to such. Correct. Such Which is why I think he, why I think he, he managed to, uh, to pull it off. Um, to jump topics a little bit, uh, what, what do you think about something you've written about uh, what do you think about the mass surveillance programs by the NSA and also probably by other organizations, CIA, FBI, and others? Um, and broadly, what do you think about the importance of privacy for the American citizen? Okay. I believe that the FBI should be abolished because I believe that its culture was so corrupted by its first director John Edgar Hoover, J. Edgar Hoover, that it is impossible to reform the FBI to make its uh, agents honest, uh, to force them to obey the Constitution, the, the First, Fourth, and Fifth Amendments especially. Um, and it's a culture that cannot be changed. Uh, Hoover established the culture and no FBI director since has been able to change it. If you go online, I did on YouTube a video 
for the ACLU of Massachusetts. It was when I was on the board. It was probably when I was president of the board. I was president of the board for two years. I was on the board for 20 years. And I did a, a, a video about advising people to never, ever, ever talk to an FBI agent when they come knocking on your door. Can you uh, um, briefly explain the intuition? Yes. They Why have, not to talk to an FBI they agent? They have a system. When they come in and interview you, Two agents show up, never one. One asks the question, the other one takes notes. The, the note-taking agent takes notes, and yes. then goes back to the office and types up a report called a Form 302, which is the official record of what was asked and answered. So when I have a client interviewed by the FBI, I show up, and... I always agree, almost always agree to the interview. <laughs> but I bring a tape recorder. And I say, all right, I'm going to tape this. And they say, well, we're by regulation, we're not allowed to do the interview if it's taped. The, the record is the 302. The <laughs> agent is taking notes. I say, well, I have a policy too. My policy is to never allow a client to be interviewed unless it's recorded. So it's unfortunate, but we're going to have to end this meeting. And the agents get up and leave. And the, I have never seen a Form 302 that I consider to be accurate. The agents rec write down what they wish you had said yeah. rather than what you said. It is a wholly corrupt organization that has not gotten any better since Hoover died. And fundamentally, the, the corruption is in the culture that is uh, resisting the, the, the Constitution of the United States, Correct. the First and Fourth and Fifth Amendment. Correct. It's not, it's not financial corruption. It is, um, it is corruption of the mission. And um, I think it should be abolished. And if we need a federal investigative agency, a should be a new name, a new culture, wholly new members, a new director, and um, the, it, it, it's impossible to uh, to reform the FBI. Can you elaborate on what exactly is broken about the FBI? Is it the the uh, the famous saying um, from uh, Stalin's KG, uh, KGB head uh, Barry, uh, "Show me the man, and I'll show you the crime." Right. Is it that kind of process? Of it's, it's that kind of process. They decide who's guilty, and then they go about concocting a case against the person who's, who who, who um, they want to get. So the goal is not to find the truth or... Uh, it's to solve the, solve the case and close it and enhance their reputations. But to show that an innocent man is guilty is also solving the case from their perspective. So to falsely convict or uh, falsely imprison an innocent man is also solving the case. Well, it closes the case closes. if they falsely imprison an innocent man. They're interested in closing cases. So that's the FBI, but uh, broadly speaking about the surveillance aspect of this, what are your views uh, on the, the, the right that an American citizen has to privacy? Well, um, wiretapping and um, electronic surveillance are very, very intrusive. And um, I think that the circumstances that these tools are used should be narrowed. Um, for example, they're used in a lot of drug cases. Since I don't think drugs should be illegal in any event, I certainly think that it's a terrible violation of privacy to, to, to use wiretapping in a drug case. I could see it in cases of murder, um, possibly in cases of serious extortion, but on other kinds of crimes where they wiretap, especially drug cases, I believe drugs should all be legalized anyway. Um, I think it's um, the, 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 the price we pay as a society is not worth it. There's uh, on the Wikipedia page for nothing to hide, you're cited. In fact, your book that you gave me today, Three Felonies a Day is cited. So nothing to hide argument. That's an argument that uh, if you're a well-behaved citizen, you have nothing to hide and therefore your privacy can be violated. Well, 
The problem is that under the federal criminal code, uh, uh, particularly the federal criminal code, mm -hmm. um, it is very easy to be charged with a crime. Now, why? Under the Constitution, the federal government does not have plenary criminal jurisdiction. That's up to the states. How is it that the feds indict in so many areas of American life? It's because the Supreme Court has allowed the following absolutely insane situation to prevail. Anything can be made a federal crime if, in the course of the commission of the crime, the means of interstate communication or travel are used. That means that if you commit a crime, which is ordinarily would be a state crime, and you use the telephone or you send a letter, it suddenly becomes federal. Mm -hmm. That means that the limitation that the founding fathers who wrote the Constitution intended to keep the feds out of daily life and to give that jurisdiction to the states has been completely thwarted. Because I can't think of a, a case where somebody doesn't use a telephone in the course of planning, discussing something that's arguably criminal. And so this limited authority, the federal government, to bring charges in criminal cases is illusory. The feds can indict a ham sandwich. So basically everybody's guilty. And if uh if if, if the if the feds wanna bring you in, they can. They Correct. can find a way. And that allows them to terrorize people who are dissidents. Yeah. What is broken, what works about the American criminal justice system from your perspective from the jury all, the jury system. The jury system. Yes. You like the jury system. Everyday like citizens the, representing Twelve ordinary people have to agree unanimously in order to convict. Uh, what do you think about the highest court in the land, the Supreme Court? What works and what is broken about the Supreme Court as an institution? What are its strengths and weaknesses? Well, the Supreme Court is 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 um, unfortunately fairly political, and um, the current Supreme Court is overruling precedents which are, it's really uh, improper. I mean, precedents cannot, should not be overruled so easily. Um, it's about to overrule the uh, affirmative action. Now, I'm opposed to affirmative action. I think I made that clear earlier in our discussion. But still, um, it's a precedent, and it, it should be given some respect. But in order to, um, in order to, uh, uh, in order to propagate a more conservative agenda, the court is treating precedent as if it doesn't have any any role. And that's a huge mistake. Um, some of the congressmen on the Democratic side are looking to enlarge the court in order to basically do what Franklin Roosevelt was not able to do. Um, and, and that is... Uh, change the court's philosophy. But I think that's very short-sighted because this is a long this is a long game. This is a republic we have here. And uh, anyone who tries to, for example, enlarge the court from nine to 12 in order to get more um, liberals on the court, then some other administration will try to enlarge it from 12 to 15 to get more liberals on the court. You'd have a, a, a constant um, fiddling with a very important institution. So the law should have more lasting power than the, the bickering, the political bickering of the day. Correct. Let me ask you, you've uh, lived one heck of a, a life and um, fought a lot of battles and you continue to do so with the Harvard Board of Overseers. So first of all, thank you for that. But uh, we're all human, we're all mortal. 
Do you ponder your death? Do you ponder your mortality? Are you afraid of it? Well, let me say this. My father died at 48. He died because he smoked. He died at 48 because he smoked four packs of camels a day. He got a massive heart attack at 43. He continued to smoke despite the, that. He died at 48. So I did not expect to live this long because I thought it was genetic. It turns out it was cigarettes. So here I am. I'm going to be 81 on May 10th. I was born on May 10th, 1942, which is Mother's Day, coincidentally. And I realize I'm not going to live forever. I also take pride in the fact that I have demonstrated that a lawyer does not have to go with a law firm in order to ma manage to make it. You can make your own, write your own, what's the word? Write your own ticket. I've done that. Um, I agree that I've had a an elite education. I went to Princeton and Harvard Law School. But I don't think you have to necessarily go to elite institutions in order to really make it. You need to work hard. But you shouldn't put yourself in a place where you, you're not going to feel comfortable and, what's the word, empowered. Like I refuse to take Vorenberg's invitation for tenure track position at Harvard Law School. Um, I'll, I'll tell you one, one other story that illustrates this. I was originally pre-med. My freshman, sat four years at Princeton, I was in the pre-med program. Why? Because my parents wanted me to marry the daughter of our family physician. And the idea was, I was going to go to medical school, and I was going to go into medical practice with him in Hackensack, New Jersey. We had moved from Brooklyn at the time. Long story why we had to move from Brooklyn had to do with my father's having a problem with the Furriers Union and having his life threatened. And uh, we moved to Maywood, New Jersey, because he got a job in a fur shop in Passaic, New Jersey. And... A family physician, they had three daughters, the oldest of whom was my age. She went to Hackensack High School. I went to Pagoda High School. They're both in both North Bergen County. And the idea was that she and I were going to marry. I was going to become, I was going to go to medical school. I was going to take, become a partner of her father in his medical practice in Hackensack. When he retired, I was going to inherit the practice. This, this scenario was concocted by Carolyn's mother and my mother. In my sophomore year of, at Princeton, I won a fellowship to spend that summer. It was my sophomore and junior year in Paris. I was fluent by then. I had taken an accelerated French course my freshman and sophomore year. And... Um, I went to Paris. It was my first time out of the country. And um, I spent the entire summer working, supporting myself there. Princeton paid the airfare, and I, I earned money uh, for room and board. And I thought about my life, and I decided, number one, I didn't want to be a physician. I wanted to be a lawyer. Number two, I didn't want to marry... Carolyn. And I came back. I changed from pre-med to pre-law. I broke up with Carolyn, who was by that time at school at Douglas, right down the road from Princeton. She had followed me, uh, or I had followed her. And um, my life suddenly took a wholly different turn. So that summer in Paris, Paris had a outsized effect on my life. Every year, the Brattle Theater shows Casablanca, where Bogart has this great line. He says, we'll always have Paris. Mm -hmm. And I think to myself, I always used to say to Elsa, we used to see Casablanca every Valentine's Day because it was such an important movie to me because mm -hmm. Paris was transformative in my life, and we went to Paris every year. During my vacation, we went to Paris. That was where uh, she took some great pictures. 
um, visor because he was this high and this high. And they were hanging up in the house. And um, so I always, I, I, and even after Elsa's death, I've seen Casablanca twice now. She she died in the 2020. And um, I'm always, I always think we'll always have Paris. We'll always have Paris. <sighs> well, Harvey, um, like I said, I hope uh, I hope you're very successful in your um, in your run for the Harvard Board of Overseers. I think what you stand for in the, in the realm of freedom of speech is, uh, I think, the thing that makes these universities great institutions in American culture. And um, I'll do everything I can to help you succeed. And I just uh, am really grateful for all the work you've done, and I'm grateful that you were talking with me today. This is amazing. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this conversation with Harvey Silverglade. To support this podcast, please check out our sponsors in the description. And now, let me leave you with some words from Harry S. Truman. Once the government is committed to the principle of silencing the voice of the opposition, it is only one way to go, and that is down the path of increasingly repressive measures until it becomes the source of terror to all its citizens and creates a country where everyone lives in fear. Thank you for listening and hope to see you next time.